You're about to be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. For the next hour and 30 minutes, this program will present in person such bright stars as... Fred Allen. Phil Baker. Marlene Deasley. Portland Hoffa. Edward G. Robinson. Danny Thomas. Fran Warren. Meredith Wilson. And my name, darlings, is Tallulah Bankhead. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show. The Big Show, 90 minutes with the most scintillating personalities in the entertainment world, brought to you this Sunday and every Sunday at the same time as the Sunday feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And here is your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable, Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darlings, here it is, 1951. 1951. It seems like only yesterday it was 1941. But, of course, 1941 was five years ago. (laughs) I may be a poor mathematician, but I'm going to be the youngest poor mathematician. Well, I woke up this morning, thank goodness. (laughs) And I looked in the mirror and I said to myself, Good morning, Clula, darling. I call everybody darling, darling. (laughs) And I had a little talk with myself. Now, I talk to myself all the time. Goodness knows no one else has anything I want to listen to. <laughs> so I said, now, look here, Tallulah. This is a new year. Now, let's make it a good one. No tantrum, no temper, no insults. And the face in the mirror said, yes, darling, and no radio show. <laughs> it was then that I realized that it wasn't a mirror at all I'd been looking out of my window at a poster advertising all about Eve. <laughs> Pardon me, Tallulah. May I interrupt this conversation you are having with yourself? Fred, darling. Fred Allen. (laughs) Tallulah, I happen to be all about eavesdropping. And uh, (laughs) I overheard you talking to yourself. You don't know how lucky you are. You know, I was on the air 12 years before I found out that I was talking to myself. Now, Fred, I loved you on radio. You had a faithful audience. They never missed your show. Ah, and my audience is still faithful to Lula. I've been out of radio for three years, and they still don't miss my show. (laughs) Darling, I'll never understand why you don't have a radio program. Well, I had to give it up. Circumstances to Lula. I had a minor problem. You see, my hooper and my pulse both went down to five. (laughs) Well, you look simply divine now, darling. That trip to Florida... Must have done you a lot of good. I just adore your tan. Well, this, this isn't a tan. It's sort of a yellow frostbite. <laughs> you know, it went down to five in Florida, too. It was so cold in Miami, I had to put sleeves in my electric blanket so that I could go out in the daytime. <laughs> my teeth kept chattering all night. Well, why don't you keep them in hot water? <laughs> Well, darling, you of all people don't have to worry about not having a regular radio show. No, that's true, Tulula. I am gainfully unemployed. Isn't it boring, darling? Nothing to do all day. Oh, I'm always busy. I have a hobby. Unemployment insurance. (laughs) Unemployment insurance? Yes, that is uh, uh, controlled by a government agency that insures you against finding a job. (laughs) They pay you a small weekly stipend while they try to place you. Now, last week, for example, I was interviewed for a job in the automat as a uh, banana turner. A banana turner? Yes, in the automat, you see, sometimes when the fruit chef is in a hurry, he will put a banana into a compartment the long way. Well, the banana sticks out and the little door won't close. And that's where I come in. (laughs) You... As the banana turner? I turn the banana crosswise so that little door can close, you see. (laughs) Now, Fred, you're joking, darling, with this unemployment insurance. Surely you have some plans for the future. Well, yes, I have. I'm coming back to radio. 
Oh, that's such good news, Fred. With really? a medium like you coming back to radio, radio could really come back. Is that trip necessary? <laughs> well, confidential, confidentially to Lou. <laughs> it's that tea. I'm off a tea. I can't leave it out of my words, even. Uh, confidentially to Lula, I'm not coming back as a comedian. That's too tough a job today. When I come back, I'm going to have the easiest job in radio. What's that, Fred? I am going to be a sponsor. Fred, you a sponsor? Mm -hmm. You must be losing your mind. Well, that's the first requisite. <laughs> well, what are you going to say? Oh, nothing. You know, I think that people have been listening to radio commercials for so long that their houses are cluttered up with stuff that they really don't need. So I am going to sell nothing, and I'm going to charge 37 cents for it. Fred, isn't that a lot of money for nothing? Oh, the way prices are today, about all you can get for 37 cents is nothing. And for 47 cents, you can get the big economy size nothing. <laughs> well, I can sponsor a radio show and build it around a personality who could make something big out of nothing. Next. Alan! Well, here's nothing with a head on it. <laughs> well, as I stand here and cleverly feign astonishment, uh, if it isn't Portland. <laughs> so, Lola, you, uh, you remember Portland, Hopper? I recognize the city, but the state is unfamiliar. <laughs> Portland Hopper, that's an odd name. Why do they call you Portland? Well, Miss Bankhead, you see, I was born in Seattle. Then why didn't they call you Seattle? <laughs> Seattle is such a silly name for a girl. Yes, really. <laughs> well, lucky for you, you weren't twins. Your mother might have called you Walla Walla. <laughs> oh, come now, Miss Bankhead, you're joking. That's what we're here for, darling. <laughs> oh, honestly, Miss Bankhead, we do have twins in our family, but it would have been ridiculous to call them Walla Walla. Well, what did they call the twins? Minneapolis and St. Paul. <laughs> well, look, Mrs. Rand and Mrs. McNally, I hate to, uh, I hate to put my map in here at this time, but I'm sure that uh, Portland didn't stop by to discuss the states of the Union. Now, what is on your, you should excuse the expression, your mind, Portland? Well, Mama says she's an admirer of Miss Bankhead's from way back. See, that's rather a broad statement. But uh, carry on, Portland. <laughs> Mama listens to Miss Bankhead's shows religiously. Well, it's on Sunday, so naturally. <laughs> I think your mother is darling, Portland. Mama asked me to ask you a question, Miss Bankhead, if you won't get mad. Mad? Oh, why should I get mad, darling? Of course I won't get mad. Haven't you heard, Portland, dear? It's the new Tallulah. No tantrums, no temper. Especially not for such a devoted listener as your mother. Mad, indeed. <laughs> now, darling, uh, what is your mother's question, darling? How old are you? <laughs> None of your mother's neurotic business. <laughs> Say, Portland, if you will climb down from that chandelier, I'd like to tell you that you may inform your mother that I am going back on radio myself. I'm going to be a sponsor. Really, Mr. Allen? What are you going to sell? Well, I'm going to have a program that sells nothing. Oh, just like your old program. <laughs> In rebuttal, Miss Hopper, I must say that you have the makings of another Tallulah, only an octave higher. On this high note of hilarity, let us take leave of beautiful Portland, the city of Hopper, <laughs> and wend our way towards Meredith Wilson and his big show, Orchestra and Chorus. Here they are now in their first bright, sparkling arrangement of 1951, a brand new tune by that grand old master, Zygmunt Romberg. Zing, 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 zing. <laughs> So 
sum, 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 we'll sing, we'll sum, we'll fill the room with a sing, sing, and a sum, sum, and a sum, sum, and a sum, sum, and a sum, 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 my little heart goes, when I hear this melody play, sing, sing, sum, 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 a simple tune. Darling. Oh, yes, Miss Bankhead. I'll uh, be over there in just a minute. Oh, Fred. Uh, yes, Tallulah. Have you met Meredith Wilson? No, I have never had the pleasure. How lucky can you be? <laughs> well, I'll tell you as soon as I meet him. Now, believe me, Fred, your luck is running out. Yeah? Here he comes now. You're trapped. Trapped? Uh, you mean... Uh... Fred, now listen, I'm very yeah. fond of Meredith. I think he's divine. I adore him. You'll find he's a lovely chap, but you mustn't encourage him, or he'll bore you to tears with some revolting story about that remote little hamlet he comes from, Mason City. Ah, oh, yes. she's it, Lola. Here he is, Mister Allen. See, I've been wanting to meet you. Really? You'll find me a lovely chap if you don't encourage me to bore you to tears with some revolting story about that remote little <laughs> hamlet I come from. Mason City, Iowa. Why, I am very interested, Mr. Meredith. You'll be sorry, darling. Press on, Meredith. <laughs> well, sir, gentlemen, back there in Mason City, Iowa... <laughs> I want to say back there in Mason City, Iowa, that's my hometown, you know. Or... I know that. <laughs> well, it is, you know. Well, sir, the big social event of the season used to be the Strawberry Festival. Uh-huh. I tell you, this one year, it was wilder than a corn husking bee. Really? Jiminy crickets. Oh, excuse me, Miss Bankhead. I forgot there was a lady present. <laughs> Fred, have you ever heard a more inane little tale? Well, this is the first time I've ever seen a fellow fall asleep in the middle of his own story. <laughs> He's lucky. Uh, well, sir, this one year that I'm talking about... Yeah. We just couldn't wait for the strawberries to arrive. No. I didn't tell you this, but yeah. we don't grow strawberries in Mason City. No? No. Every year we have them chipped in for our strawberry festival. One at a time. <laughs> well, of course, without strawberries, it wouldn't be a strawberry festival. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, anyhow, they were coming all the way from Minneapolis, you know. Oh, yeah. yes. I know his brother, St. Paul. <laughs> Well, sir, when those strawberries came in, we had a festival that I'll never forget as long as I live. Yeah. And Mason City will never forget it either. Not as long as you live, they won't. <laughs> well, thank you. Boy, it was some party. Every boy and girl in town was there, and they'll never forget that evening. On account of that strawberry festival, some of them later got married, some got engaged. Something happened to everybody who was there. What happened to you? I ate too many strawberries and broke out in a rash. <laughs> and from then on, whenever I hear the word strawberry, I just want to run. Strawberry, strawberry, strawberry! May I take a box of those strawberries, lady? <laughs> well, Fred, was that or was that not the dullest story you've ever heard in your life? Well, sir, Tallulah... <laughs> 
It's a funny thing, you know. When I was a kid back there in Boston, a suburb of Mason City, we used to have we used to have these bean festivals. And I remember Bees, bees, bees. Oh. Isn't this awful? Mary's and his strawberry festival. Fred and his half baked story about beans. Now, I remember when I was a little girl, <laughs> down there in Alabama, we used to have cotton festivals. I'll never forget the year Jefferson Davis and I led the Grand March. Said, what am I saying? <laughs> We have come now, darlings, to an exciting moment in our big show tonight. We ask you to join us in bidding welcome to an outstanding personality, a distinguished artist, Mr. Edward G. Robinson. We hear now, we hear now a famous story by the well-known writer and celebrated master of suspense, Mr. Cornell Woodridge. The big show stars Mr. Edward G. Robinson in the role of Harold Hardiker. And Woolwich's after dinner story. The scene the sumptuous dining hall in the apartment of Harold Hardiker, Park Avenue. A soft summer night in August. A lavish dinner for five has come to the brandy. Yes, it's very nice. So, uh, Evans, uh, kindly pass that silver bowl. Let each of the gentlemen see what it contains. Uh, Mr. McKenzie, first. Not another dessert, Mr. Hunt. No, not quite. Uh, now, Mr. Kenshaw. Uh, mayonnaise? Close. Uh, Mr. Pendergast. What is this, a gag? No, I'm afraid not. Uh, Mr. Lambert, please. I'm too full to care, sir. All I can say is it looks hot, sticky, and it smells funny. Eggnog, huh? Oh, that's very good. Oh, uh, Evans, uh, place the bowl in the exact center of the table. Now, that's it. Thank you. Oh, and uh, you may remove the glasses and coffee. Okay, mister, we give up. What's in that thing? Oh, uh, quite a number of things, Mr. Pendergast. Whites of eggs, mustard, certain other ingredients, all well beaten together. Sounds like an antidote. That's not a funny joke, Mackenzie. No, it's not a joke. It is an antidote. Oh, uh, Evans, you have the gun I gave you. All right, stand there. Please, on the other side of those doors and see to it that no one comes out of here. If they try, you know what to do. I thought there was something screwy with this idea coming to your house for supper. Why should you invite four characters you don't even know? Then throw us a feed like this. I'm getting out of here. I assure you, Pendergast, Evans will not hesitate to shoot. He has orders. You see, gentlemen, there's a murderer in our midst. What? Oh, what are you talking about? Gentlemen, I know you all quite well. Mackenzie, you're still a salesman of water coolers. Lambert, yes. you're a salesman of novelties. Can't you? You're still a clerk. Pendergast? Well, the police have an interesting dossier on you. What of it? Only this. One of you is a murderer. One of you killed my son. You killed him a year ago today. The murderer has not yet paid the price. You setting yourself above the proper constituted authorities? The findings of the medical examiner were suicide while of unsound mind. Why do you hold him in This company? isn't a discussion. This is an execution. A year ago, an elevator making its descent picked up at different floors in an office building five passengers. Five men, presumably, on their way home from work. Including the operator, there were six people making the descent. That elevator went out of control and crashed to the basement, killing the operator. Five of you were still alive after the crash. While the rescue crew worked with acetylene torches to cut through the steel top of the car, one of you shot and killed my son, lying there in the dark. The inquest found that he was killed with his own gun, died by his own hand. But you know differently. I know different. Oh, but surely, Mr. Hardecker, the inquest was thorough. I recall that there was testimony offered to prove that uh, your son had been of a highly nervous type, that he was overwrought, that the noise of the torches, magnified as it was within the car, was the factor that pushed your son beyond endurance. Yeah, yeah, it was rough in that elevator. 
I thought we were going to get burned down. My ears have never been the same. I can still hear that roaring. The net is, Mr. Hardegger, that if you were right, the police would have long since proved it. After all, they are interested in justice. It's their business. But it's been a year now, and the case is still marked closed. No, no, Mr. McKenzie, it is not closed. You see, I know who the man is. It's taken me a year to find out, but now I know beyond the shadow of a doubt. The police wouldn't listen to me. They insisted it was suicide. But I demand justice for the taking of my son's life. It is now nine o'clock. In a matter of minutes, one of you will be dead. You probably noticed at dinner that each of you was served separately. One dish and one alone was deadly. It's putting in its slow, sure work right now as we sit here. Look at that silver bowl, gentlemen. It contains the antidote. I have no wish to set myself up as executioner above the law. Let the murderer be the chooser. Let him reach out and save himself and stand convicted before all of you. Or let him keep silent and go down to his death without confessing privately executed for what can't be publicly proved. In, say, ten, twelve minutes, Collapse will come without warning. But, but are you sure you did this to the right one? No, I haven't made any mistake. The waiter was carefully rehearsed. You're all perfectly unharmed, but the killer. Now, he tells us, a fine way to digest a meal. Why didn't you serve the murderer first so then the rest of us could eat in peace at least? Shut up, Lambert. You can't be sane and do a thing like this. Did you ever have a son, Mr. McKenzie? Can't stand it. Let me out of here. I didn't do it. I don't feel so good. Then why don't you take the medicine our dear host has provided? Why not, Lambert? Just just reaching for a cigar, Mac. Got a light tender gas? Thanks. Something's shaking, either my head or your hand. What are you trying to do? You trying to kid us? What's the idea of reaching like that if you ain't gonna take the stuff? Can't you see this ain't no time to kid? This guy Hardecker is nuts. He's not here than a fruitcake. With it, Pendergast. Act like a man. Hardecker, you're alienating whatever sympathies do you by pulling a stunt like this. I'm not asking for sympathy. It's atonement I want. Three lives were taken from me. My only son, my daughter-in-law, and their prematurely born child. I demand payment for that. I can't breathe. He's done it to me, so help me. Gas around the heart may be pentagast. Don't fall for it if you're not sure. Don't fall for it if I drop dead. Are you going to bring me back? He ought to be arrested for this. Arrested? He's going to get sued like nobody was ever sued before. When I get through with I'd say about four minutes left. Well, the murderer seems to prefer death to confession. Oh! What's the matter, Mackenzie? It hit you? My heart. Hey! (laughs) Oh, dear God in heaven, I didn't do nothing to deserve this. I'm dying, I know, I'm dying. If the antidote is not downed in 30 seconds, it will most certainly fail. 30 seconds. No. No, no. Give me that ball. There. I've drunk it. I've drunk it all. Will it save me? Don't. Don't stare at me. Tell me. Will it save me? Did I drink it in time? So it's you, Kentro. Here. Here, as I killed him. I'd kill him again. Over and over and over a thousand times. He used your name, cashed in on your wealth and position to work himself in my company. Got my job. Got me fired. (laughs) Yes. I killed your son. (laughs) I killed him. (laughs) So what? So what, Hardecker? No matter what they've all heard me say just now, you'll never be able to prove I did it. Nobody saw me. Only the dark. That's where you're going. Into the dark. (laughs) You you can't prove it. Nobody saw me. Only the... Only the... Dark. He fell like a ton of bricks. What's the matter with him? He's dead. Well, Hardecker, I guess your antidote didn't work in time. No, that wasn't the antidote. That was the poison itself. 
He hadn't been given any poison until he gulped that down. He convicted himself and carried out sentence on himself with one and the same gesture. I hadn't known which one of you it was until then. I'd only known it hadn't been my son's own doing, because you see the noise of those torches burning above your heads while the crew worked to free you from the elevator wouldn't have affected you much. It was partly death from birth. And now, I'm ready to take my own medicine. Call the police. Let them and their prosecutors and their courts of law decide whether I killed him or his own guilty conscience did. Bravo, bravo to Edward G. Robinson and the supporting cast for a splendid performance. Come over here, Eddie, darling. We have so much to talk about. Ah, oh, shut up. <laughs> Red, isn't that darling? Sweet little Eddie Robertson trying to act like a gangster. And yeah, you shut up, too. Wait a minute. I didn't say anything Well, just yet. in case you're thinking of well, saying well, anything, just shut up. <laughs> now, Ed, you're kidding, aren't you? What do you think this buzz on my hip is? Little Egg's thread. <laughs> the 45, see? Have you ever considered cutting down on potatoes? Now, listen, you big tomato. <laughs> You get in my way and I'll push a grapefruit in your mush and throw a pineapple into your apartment, see? Say, I'll take a pound of that fruit salad, sir. <laughs> now, look here, I'm warning you, see? One more crack out of you and you'll need protection insurance. Say, I'll take some of that, too. It'll go well with my unemployment insurance. <laughs> the poly, a now, small poly going there. Wait a minute, Fred. Now, look here, Ed, I don't understand this. Now, I've always known you to be a mild, sweet-tempered, intellectual man who spends most of his time collecting valuable paintings. Yeah, that's a blind. On the backs of them, their paintings are blueprints of some of the biggest banks in the country, see? <laughs> but, Mr. Robinson, I understood that you had a collection of authentic paintings by Rembrandt, Renoir, and Degas. Oh, sure, sure. I had those guys paint over the blueprints. But Rembrandt, Renoir, and Degas, they're all dead. Well, that's the idea. Dead men don't talk, see? <laughs> now, Eddie... Now, don't no, butt Eddie. me, will you? Don't butt me, see? Now, don't get in my way. See, I'm hot as nails, see? You're going to get hurt, see? Please, I'm getting seasick. <laughs> come here, come here, short, broad, and... Broad. Don't <laughs> go teaching how to fool around with me, see? I'm going to give you a little lesson as to how to behave, see? Stop. This is the movie Edward G. Robinson. The movie Edward G. Robinson, not the real Edward G. Robinson. Well, What's the matter with you? Well, everybody's picking on me. All my life, I never had a chance. I used to be on Broadway, and I was a nice, quiet guy who minded his business, never got in any trouble. And then I went to Hollywood, and I did a gangster picture. From then on, my troubles began. People avoided me. Children cried when I came into a room. Say, wait a minute. If I had known this was for the Academy Award, I'd have worn my tux and my suspenders. No. <laughs> when I, when I walked down the street, horses would bold. It must be for the Rotting Academy Award. Oh, I just hated myself. <laughs> so I, I hired a publicity man. No, really, now, please don't laugh at me. I hired a publicity man to tell people that I was really a gentleman, but it worked too well, and suddenly people began to push me around. The minute they knew I wasn't really tough, they took advantage of me. So I gave that up, and I tried to go back to being tough. And I was doing so well, too, until you hit me. <laughs> the humiliation of it. To be hit by a woman in public. Tallulah, why did you do it? Now, why? Why did you do it? I'll take a pound of that ham. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment, darling. Just as soon as I ring my chimes, this is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. The Big Show. 
This is the National Broadcasting Company Sunday Extravaganza with the most scintillating personalities in show business. The Big Show, the Sunday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival, is brought to you by the makers of Anacin for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. The big stars on this program are Fred Allen, Bill Baker, Marlena Dietrich, Portland Hoffa, Edward G. Robinson, Danny Thomas, Fran Warren, Meredith Wilson and the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus, and every week, your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darling, here we are with the big show and a dipper full of stars. The big dipper, of course. I'm particularly thrilled over the impending appearance this evening of Malena Dietrich. Malena Dietrich. A magic name, which is synonymous throughout the world with beauty, charm, talent, glamour. Of course, darling, you realize they hand me this stuff. I have to read it. <laughs> I don't know why they think she's so attractive. Just because she has beautiful hair, a lovely face, a perfect figure, gorgeous legs. I'll take 110 pounds of that. <laughs> Bill Baker. Hello, Tallulah. It's really a pleasure to be... Which camera do I face? Camera? Well, there are no cameras here, darling. This is a not a television show. It's a radio show. A radio show? So why did I wear my toupee? Well, at least it looks nice. See, I even fooled you, Tulu. I don't really wear a toupee. I know, darling. I was just joking. But I always thought they were worn in the center of the head. <laughs> Look, honey, I'll wear mine the way I like, and you wear yours the way you like. <laughs> now, darling, what were we talking about before we started blowing our tops? Well, I don't know why, but I had an idea this was a television show. I'm sure I've seen you on television. Aren't you the one who wears those low-cut gowns? That's Emerson, darling. This is RCA. Oh, I see. <laughs> but I'm sure I've seen you on television, Tulu. I can't remember where, but... Uh, oh, well, never mind. But surely you must be thinking of going on television, Tulula. Well, to be very honest, Phil, I've been wrestling with the idea. That's where I saw you wrestling. <laughs> oh, I... I couldn't be a wrestler, darling. Why not? You're a good enough actress. <laughs> Listen, to <laughs> Believe me, television is for you, especially now. The screens are getting larger and larger and larger. And your check is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Look, Tallulah, it would be a sin to convert this radio show into a TV show. I know just how to do it. Well, I'm willing to try it. Goodness knows I've tried everything else. All right, I'll try TV, even if it kills me. Well, we all have to go sometime. <laughs> What's the first step? Well, as you know, in television, they don't use any scripts at all. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just put our scripts aside for a while and see how it works? All right. Well, this is pretty dull. <laughs> Nothing's happening. Well, that's television. <laughs> Oh, but they must have something else. Well, personally, I don't watch television very much. It sort of depresses me. I used to look at those mystery shows. So many people get killed. It's all very sad. Well, television is great for baseball. The Giants are my team. I watched the Giants play all last summer. Yes, it's all very sad. It really is. <laughs> Not this year it won't be, brother. But there's... Huh? Come on, applaud, Come on, applaud. <laughs> I don't that lib on the show. <coughs> Was that an ad lib? I don't know, darling. Yippee, Look at you, you really put it over there. But there's one thing I do like on television. What's that? They're getting some beautiful new actresses. They're so young and gorgeous. Yes, it's all very sad. <laughs> well, television isn't for me. I love the theater. It's vibrant. It's real. It's a true expression of great art. The theater doesn't limit you to the narrow space of a camera... And the hot lights leave you to wonder if you're going to remember your lines instead of reacting to your fellow players and giving your character that third dimension so necessary to make it a living, breathing thing. See what I mean, Phil? Yeah, I don't photograph well either. <laughs> well, 
I think I'll stick to radio where I'm doing very well. Who said? Listen, what's so terrific about this show? Great comedians, magnificent dramatic actors, sensational singers. What have you got in this program that you can't get in any Broadway show right now for six sixty? Me, darling. <laughs> But with all that, you're still missing one element that would really make this a big show. Oh, what's that, Phil? Me, darling. (laughs) Well, it's been so long having you on this program, Phil. (laughs) I don't get it. (laughs) So, so long, darling. Happy unemployment insurance. I didn't mean to get fresh. It's just that I play the accordion, you know, and after listening to this show for so many weeks, and now after meeting you in person, I feel that you should have an accordion to support you. Well, thank you, darling, but fortunately, I can still get around by myself. (laughs) Believe me, Tulu, the accordion would compliment your voice. Well, that would be a change around here. (laughs) Why does everyone poke fun at my voice? I can't understand it. I can't understand it either. To me, you have a voice like any other normal American boy. Play, Phil. Oops, sorry, wrong program. Thank you, Jalula. I'd like to play a tune I wrote especially for this program 20 years ago. (laughs) Strange interlude. Would you like to hear it? No, darling. But I'm sure that won't stop you. I wrote this taut song on one of the saddest days of my life. I was engaged to a lovely girl, but we had a quarrel. I wrote this on the day the ring was returned. She made me give it back. time you suffer from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, take Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing anison tablets from their own dentist or physician. And in this way, discovered the incredibly fast relief anison brings from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So, the next time a headache strikes, take anison for this wonderfully fast relief. Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison comes in handy boxes of 12 and 30 
Economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. Get Anison at any drug counter. Very well said, Ed Hurley High. Hurley Hope. I have so much trouble with that darling man's name. Now, where were we? Oh, yes, yes. I was about to... Um... Hello, Tallulah. Ah, oh, hello, Fran. Fran Waring, darling. <laughs> How are you today, Fran, sweetie? Oh, I'm very excited, Tallulah. Yeah? What with Marlena Dietrich on the show, she's so glamorous. Uh, I've heard that said about me, darling. <laughs> and she's such an international celebrity. I've heard that said about me, darling. Who? I remember she was my ideal when I was a child. And I've heard that said about... Oh, Oh, darling. You know, Tallulah, with Marlena on the show, I knew we girls would have a lot of competition. So I thought I dressed very carefully today. I really extended myself. Darling, your extension is showing. (laughs) Besides, I wouldn't let Marlena Dietrich upset you. She's just another glamorous, beautiful woman. No, she doesn't bother me as long as you're here, Tallulah. It's so reassuring to see your old face. (laughs) Uh, Now, uh, uh, just a moment, Fran Warren. You're making it very difficult for us to remain friends. Oh, I'm so sorry, Tallulah. I didn't mean that at all. I don't think you have an old face. I don't think your face is as old as the rest of you. Uh, No, no, I I didn't mean that either. (laughs) Fran, darling, it would probably be wiser for both of us if the next time you opened your mouth, it was to sing. What song do you have in mind? Don't take my love from me. All right, darling, I won't if you'll sing. Meredith, if you please, sir.
Well, you're in great voice today, Fran, and, um... Hello, Tallulah, darling. Is this a dagger I see before you? <laughs> darling, this is Marlena Dietrich. Oh, Marlena, Marlena, how simply wonderful to see you again. Well, thank you, Tallulah. How long has it been? I was thinking only this morning that I haven't seen you in 20... Oh, careful, Marlena, darling. People are listening. Weeks. Oh, darling, weeks. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, Tallulah. Yes. After all these years, guess whom I met the other day? Claude. I ran into him on the street. Hard, I trust. Why, Tallulah, precious, he was so crazy about you. Oh, no, Pat, it was you he was crazy about. Of course not, darling. Everybody knows he was crazy about you. Well, now that I come to think of it, he was crazy about me. Yes, he was crazy. <laughs> Isn't he sweet? Dear old Claude, does he know that you're a grandmother now? <clears throat> oh, oh, excuse me, darling. He knew you were a grandmother then, of course. <laughs> Isn't he sweet? Tell me, Tolola, what's new? I hear so little about you since you have hidden yourself away in radio. <laughs> oh, come now, Marlena, sweet. If you could read, you'd know that I just got a big spread in Collier's magazine this week. Well, you need a big magazine, Tallulah. <laughs> Fortunately, I can still make the slimmer magazine. As a matter of fact, Tallulah, I was just interviewed this morning by the Woman's Home Companion. No. Are they changing the name to Old Woman's Home Companion? <laughs> Now, let's face it, darling. Look at you. False eyelashes, mascara, powder, rouge, lipstick. Yes, darling, but the rest of it is all me. Well, <laughs> 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 so, look, what are we talking about? Let's stop pretending and tell the truth. There's no use denying it. I'm not quite as young as I used to be. Everybody knows that I'm a mother, and now I'm a grandmother. The silly idea women have that they must lie about their age is ridiculous. I don't care if everybody knows how old I am. Do you really mean that, Marlena? Of course, Tallulah. Well then, darling, how old are you? Thirty-two. <laughs> Thirty-two? Now, just a minute, Marlena. Do you mean that you're only one year older than I am? <laughs> Look here, Marlena. Marlena, my sweet, I happen to know that you have, have a daughter who's been married for a few years and has two children. Isn't it amazing? One day on her birthday, I turned around, and there was my daughter, three years older than I am. <laughs> now, darling, why don't we stop this stupid quarreling? All right. Would you like me to do a number? Oh, please do, Marlena. You've performed such miracles with numbers. May I sing Falling in Love Again? By all means, Marlena. Sing Falling in Love Again. Why don't you sing it for us again, just the way you sang it 35 years ago? <laughs> Before you were born, darling. <laughs> Thank you. 
Here's a word from RCA Victor. For five kinds of wonderful fun and all in one, there's nothing like a new RCA Victor million-proof combination console. The whole wide world of entertainment is yours. Clear, steady, million-proof television, powerful AM-FM radio, three speeds of phonograph, all in one beautiful cabinet at a truly modest price. It's not just one hit show, it's all of them especially designed for your living room. You'll watch television pictures with million-proof quality, locked in place by RCA Victor's Eyewitness Picture Synchronizer. And the RCA Victor new television picture pickup brings in the picture even in fringe areas. All the television, radio, phonograph sound comes through the famous Golden Throat Tone System. That means rich concert hall listening. And at all costs, many dollars less than you would pay if you bought the instruments one at a time. Here's entertainment you don't want to miss, and a chance to make a real saving, too. Why not see the variety of RCA Victor combination consoles for yourself? One look is all you need. Visit your RCA Victor dealer today. Thank you, Ed Hurley Hay. Huh? Hurley High. Ho, who? Ho. Well, that takes care of the vowels. Shall I try the consonants? Oh, Marlena, darling, I must tell you how divine your song was, darling. Thank you, Tallulah. Such a wonderful way to lead into the commercial. <laughs> I have you know, Tallulah, that men have killed themselves after hearing me sing. I'm sure of that, darling. <laughs> I died a little myself. <laughs> Well, we all have to go sometimes. Say, speaking of going, I think I'll be going. I've been waiting through this script looking for a line or two for myself. Why, Fred Allen. Not even a joke line, mind you. Just an ordinary old feed line would do. Any line at all. A bread line. Marlena's lines would do. (laughs) Say, as a matter of fact, Marlena's lines are perfect. And besides, not that you girls need me to throw you a curve... But I've noticed that Phil Baker had an accordion solo. Marlena Dietrich had a bronchial solo. (laughs) And I would like to play a little clarinet solo. I just happen to have my clarinet with me. Why, of course, Fred. Did you think I would do a show and neglect having you play your clarinet? Well, frankly, yes. Oh, of course you can play. Oh, goody. What a night for music lovers. (laughs) May I begin? Wait a minute, wait a minute, you guys. Edward G. Robinson, darling, what is it? You know, I'm looking for some lines myself, see. If everybody's doing a solo, I want to do one, too, see? But, Eddie, darling, what instrument do you play? I don't play any instrument, but I carry a violin case, see? <laughs> that might be odd, a machine gun solo. Well, when do we get to it? Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. How about me, fellas? Ed Hurley, you a soloist, too? Well, we all have to go sometime. Be <laughs> a solo first darling, and then Fred and Ed, they'll follow, huh? Oh, thank you, Tulola. All I wanted to say was that this portion of the program was brought to you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia, and by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. You're so long quite well, Ed Hurley. Now, Eddie Robinson, what did you have in mind? Ah, uh, spread out, you guys, see? I'm taking over the station break, see? Oh, are you still doing that imitation of Edward G. Robinson? You know, Eddie, you and I are probably the two most widely imitated people in the whole world. Oh, uh, is she imitating me now, too? <laughs> no, darling, but I am. Watch this. Ready with your clarinet, Fred? Lips akimbo, Tulu. <laughs> All right, you guys. I'm checking over, see? Now get this, see? This is NB, see? <laughs> National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> This 
This is The Big Show, where tonight the glamorous Tallulah trades darlings with the fabulous Marlene. The score at the half, Marlena 32, Tallulah 31. <laughs> Ages, that is. It's like golf darlings. <laughs> Low score wins. Four. Danny Thomas. <laughs> Please, please, no applause, no applause. With all that applause, it sets up a big wind. I'll catch a cold and wind up sounding like the Lula Bankhead. <laughs> Daddy, darling, I've been wondering when you were coming back to us. Yes, I remember I was here for the birth of this show. Mm-hmm. Nine, you should excuse the expression, weeks ago. And you were a big hit then, Danny. What have you been doing, darling? Well, I've been out in the great and glorious West, Tallulah. And as the native son of the Golden West, I kind of noticed that there ain't been nothing said about Texas in the past hour. So I'd like to sing for you a little Western song. But didn't you once tell me that you came from Toledo, uh, Ohio? Originally Tallulah, but when I was a little boy, my parents emigrated from Toledo, Ohio, and came to this country. (laughs) And then they settled in the West. To me, it's the greatest place in the whole world. And that's why I'd like to sing for you a Western song. A little song that was doing right smart before Bing Crosby came along and made a record, never. <laughs> but I reckon he didn't hurt her none. That's Western talk, man. <laughs> oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam. How'd you like to have a buffalo walk right into your living room? <laughs> the craziest song I ever sang in my whole life. Give me a home where the buffalo roam. <laughs> There's more yet where the deer and the antelope play. <laughs> what an awful looking living room you'd have after they got through. <laughs> I come here tonight representing the West. I think it's an insult writing these kind of songs, Tallulah. It's terrible. Fellas that write these songs haven't been farther west than Passaic, New Jersey. What is that other crazy song that Vaughn Monroe sang for over a year? They stole it from a lost Semitic tribe to begin with. Get a load of these words, will you? An old cowpoke went riding out one dark and windy day. And he came to rest upon a ridge as he went on his way When all at once a mighty herd of flying cows he saw <laughs> That bum must have been tighter than a hoot owl <laughs> Mighty herd of cows flying in the sky Snorting fire with hooves of steel I like that other line Their hot breath he could feel If they ever got a whiff of his They'd a keel over for sure <laughs> yippee i They stole this song, brother. What is it, so hard to write a song about the West? It's all there. The subject matter is clear and plain and beautiful. The fella just takes the time and the trouble to visit the West and spend some time there. I reckon if I were one given to making pretty speeches, I'd go to work and turn around and say to you, The West is my home. Mother Nature, resplendent in her God-given regalia, with her mountains and her valleys, her rocks and her rills, and her streams and prairie and ranch country. There's no place like the West. And there isn't a man, regardless of his creed, even if he didn't have one, that's ever stood upon the precipice of the Grand Canyon and has not been forced to exclaim in complete gratitude and wonderment. Thank God. And there's a bus leaving in 15 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) Of course, I know what you're going to say if you're a dyed-in-the-wool Easterner, a typical cosmopolite. (laughs) Especially if you're from Manhattan, I can quote you. New Yorker. What's with that West (laughs) mode? What 
is that already? What are you hacking me with the words? That means what are you chopping me with the words? I'm a kind of guy who likes to bet a horse, spin the wheel, shake the dice. What do you give me the West? You could die a slow death out there. <laughs> well, if there's anybody listening that comes under that category, I got news for you. They're waiting for you in Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> you think you're a betting man? Get out to Las Vegas. They'll bet you how the wind is going to blow next day and give you your choice of direction. <laughs> I never got both feet off the train my first trip. When some tough-looking hombre walked up to me, he cased me for a split, and he said, Hold it, Flicker, two to one, you're dead. <laughs> Would you believe it? I was afraid a bit. <laughs> I mean, there was one bet I couldn't afford to lose. <laughs> I had my first meal in Las Vegas with seven other men, sort of family style. I nudged the fella sitting next to me. I said, Would you pass a slice of bread? To help me, I caught him dealing from the bottom of the loaf. <laughs> Just a snide hint there'd be a game of poker any minute. Well, Tulu, the hint was good. The game was on. Five-card draw. I got to thinking, Chuck's five-card, a baby can play that game. Of course, baby don't win, you understand? But he can play if you want. <laughs> this baby didn't win either. Win when I tell you a royal flush wasn't good enough. <laughs> you got a rough idea what kind of game this was. What do you think beat my royal flush? A hand called Timbuktu. I never heard of it either. Timbuktu, a pair of deuces and seven, eight, nine a club. <laughs> and a six shooter about that long. I was in no mood for arguing with new rules. I played along. I finally caught the dangest hand I ever saw in five card poker. Six queens. <laughs> You're laughing. I threw him in. I didn't even bet. <laughs> and it's a dang good thing I didn't. The fellow next to me had six kings. <laughs> he come in third. <laughs> Finally, about four o'clock in the morning, I'll be dag blasted if I didn't catch Timbuk to myself. <laughs> and I'd bet it, brother, every last dollar. Lost to a pair of fours. <laughs> Same size six shooter. <laughs> fellow was nice about it. He said, I'm sorry, Bob. Timbuktu is good only once a night. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't the part of the West I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about the ranch country. Places out in Texas. Big, broad expanse of land. Fenced in by them crisscross whitewashed logs. Just such a ranch used to ride out to, visiting with a friend of mine who was a rootin', tootin', shootin' pioneer of the West, man by the name of Hopalong Manischewitz. <laughs> well, I had a matzo ball plantation. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I was out with Manischewitz one day just to see how the matzo balls were matching. <laughs> I was riding what you might call a polite horse. Every time we came to a fence, they let me go over first. <laughs> Never had so much fun in my whole life. That's the country I'm talking about. And if I were asked to sing a Western song... I reckon it'd be the kind of a song that my accompanist, Walter Pop, wrote. It's a pretty song about the West. I'm sorry I have to be the one to sing it for you, but I'm the only one who knows the words. Now, make it pretty. How I love to sing About the wonders of the golden West for I just love to sing All about my home About the mountains high And the valleys that I love the best And her purple sky I could ride a tone 
I swear, nowhere is there such beauty, and brother, you can bet, that's why the sun chose it as the place to set, I love to sing. About the glory of the golden way For I just love to sing All about my home I love to sing About Texas That's my home Thank you, Danny, darling. That was a wonderful routine. Uh, I agree, Tallulah. Oh, uh, Danny, I wish you'd been at this New Year's Eve party I went to. We could have used some entertainment. Listen, Eddie, if you wanted entertainment, you should have come to my New Year's Eve party. Uh Everybody was there. It was real high society. You know, Dukes and Counts, the Whitneys, the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers. That's a ritzy crowd you travel with, Phil. I travel with a ritzy crowd all the time. They call me all the time, Tallulah, and I love to go because they're really very democratic people now. Why, do you know something? After the party, mm-hmm. they even invited the drummer, the violinist, and me to eat with the guests. Well, uh, <laughs> I went to a party in Hollywood at the uh, Coleman's. You know, Ronald Coleman and his wife, Benita, and all the Hollywood people came. Actors, directors, comedians. There was a very funny fellow there. Mm-hmm. and stood, I uh, understand, he lives next door to the Coleman's. They had to serve early dinner because of him. At about five minutes of seven, he got up from the table, left a nickel tip, and ran like mad. Said he had to be somewhere at seven. I guess he didn't want to miss your show, Tallulah. A nickel tip with all his jack? I was at a lovely party, New Year's. Oh, really, Marlena? Who was there? Well, let me see. There was a Mr. Barry and a Mr. Harvey, Mr. Harris, Mr. Joyce, Mr. Brown... Mr. Benson? Now, uh, just a moment, darling. All men, what kind of a party was this that you went to? I didn't go to the party, Tallulah. I gave it. (laughs) Well, no wonder when I announced you were going to be on the program, I got letters of protest this week from Mrs. Barry and Mrs. Harvey and Mrs. Harris and Mrs. George and Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Benson. Oh, Tallulah. Yes, Meredith. I, uh, I had a wonderful New Year's Eve. Rini and I. Oh, dear. Uh, Rini used to be a girl, but she's now Mrs. Wilson. Get to the point, darling. Well, sir, Miss Bankhead. No. We sat around New Year's and listened to a wonderful recording of the song I wrote for the big show. Oh? May the good Lord bless and keep you. Eddie Arnold just made it for RCA, and it's such a great record that I could listen to it hour after hour. I'm sure you could. You know you can play it 5,742 times before the record wears out? I'm sure you did. Daddy, what did you do New Year's Eve? Oh, I went to a kind of a strange party, Tallulah. It was given by one of the vice presidents of this network. Well, what do you mean, strange? Well, at 12 o'clock, instead of singing All Lang Syne, he made us all stand up and sing, Oh, NBC, the gem of the ocean. (laughs) NBC, the gem of the ocean? Don't you mean... Uh, uh, uh. Wrong network, Tallulah. Tallulah? Yes, Fran? I went to a party and had a wonderful time. Everybody was so okay, and I kept singing carol after carol. But Fran, darling, at a New Year's Eve party, carols are for Christmas. That's when the party started. <laughs> oh, Miss Sykes! Miss Sykes! Yes, Rochester? <laughs> Ooh, wrong city. Wrong network again, Tallulah. Miss Sighthead, we just wanted to thank you for inviting us to your party on New Year's Eve. Yes. Did you have a nice time, darling? Oh, we had a double George time, (laughs) Lou. Where were you? Oh, darling Fred, I never go to my own. I give such dull parties. But I might just as well have stayed home. I went to one of those impossible New Year's Eve dances. It was, well, uh, well, Dorothy Parker must have been to a dance of this sort at some time or another. Because she captured it so perfectly in her amusing little piece, The Waltz. You know, darling, you're standing there, the music starts. And a man comes up. Don't 
Oh, I said, I don't you. Now, what did I say that for? I don't want to dance with this character. I don't want to dance with anybody. Even if I did, it wouldn't be with this one. I've seen the way he dances. He looks like the MC of a nightmare. Just think, not ten minutes ago, when I was sitting there with my heart bleeding for the poor dame he was dancing with. Now, I'm elected. Well, well, isn't it a small world? And you can have it, too. A little dream boat of the world. Its events are so unpredictable, are they not? There was I, minding my own business, not harming a living soul. And then this dopey Don Juan has to come into my life. All smiles and city manners to sue me for the favor of one passionate polka. Who I scarcely knows my name. Let alone what it stands for. It stands for despair, bewilderment, futility, mayhem, manslaughter and assorted murder, incorporated and unincorporated. But little does he what. I won't what his name either. I haven't the faintest idea what it is. Jukes would be my guess from the look in his eyes. How do you do, Mr. Jukes? And how is that dear little brother of yours with the two heads? <laughs> What do you say when a man asks you to dance with him? I most certainly will not dance with you. See you drop dead first? Why, thank you. I'd like to awfully, but I, I'm about to throw a fit. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Do let's dance together. It's so nice to meet a man who isn't a scary cat about catching my berry berry. <laughs> no, there was nothing for me to do but say I'd adore it. Well, we might as well get it over with. Now I know how furniture feels on moving day. <laughs> okay, cannonball. Let's run out on the field. You won the toss. You lead. <laughs> huh? Oh, why, uh, no, I think it's more of a waltz, really, isn't it? Well, we, we might just listen to the music a second, huh, shall we? Oh, yes, it is a waltz. Mine? Why, I'm simply thrilled. <laughs> I'd love to waltz with you. I'd love to waltz with you. I'd love to have my tonsils out. I'd love to be hit on the head with an atomic bomb. Well, it's too late now. I'm trapped like a trap in a trap. We're underway. Why didn't I ask him to sit this out? We'll be sitting on the floor in a minute if this keeps up. It's a good thing I warned him this is a waltz. I bet if I told him this is a rumba, we'd have made a touchdown in Times Square. <laughs> Why does he always want to be somewhere that he isn't? Why can't we stay long enough in one place to get to know the neighbors? With this constant rush, 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 rush. It's the curse of American life. That's the reason we wrote, ah! <laughs> I have to kick you, idiot. Oh, my poor shin. My poor little shin. I've had ever since I was a little girl. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Goodness, no. It didn't hurt the least bit. <laughs> And anyway, it was my fault. No, really, it wasn't. Honest, truly, truly, truly. Yes, it was, really. Oh, now, you're just being sweet to say that. It really was all my fault. I wonder what I should do. Throttle him this instant with my naked hands. I'll let him have a stroke and drop in his tracks. Maybe it's best not to make a scene. I guess I'll just lie low and let him burn himself out. <laughs> he can't keep this up indefinitely. He's only human. Well, I wonder. I don't want to be the oversensitive type. You can't tell me that kick was unpremeditated. <laughs> when it comes to kicking, I'm outraged womanhood. When you kick me in the shin, smile. I bet he grew up in the hill country. I bet they had to throw him on his back to get his shoes off. <laughs> what? Oh, no, it's lovely. No, it's simply lovely. It's the loveliest waltz I ever heard, isn't it? Yes, I think it's lovely, too. Yeah, sure. Well, watch it to me if I have to spend the next two years in a plastic cast. <laughs> well, who wants to live forever? Dance, little gypsy, dance while you can. I wonder if the band leader shoots you when you break a leg. <laughs> oh, dear, dear. Oh, he's all right, thank goodness. For a while, I thought they'd have to carry him off the field. Oh, I couldn't bear to have anything happen to him. Ah! Get off! <laughs> I ain't left you hulking peasant. What do you think I am anyway, a gang plank? Oh! Oh, no, no. Of course, it didn't hurt a bit. <laughs> Why? It didn't hurt a bit. Honestly, it was all my fault. You see, 
See that little snap of yours? Well, it's, it's perfectly lovely, but it, it's just a tiny bit tricky to follow it first. Oh, did you work it up yourself? You really did? Well, aren't you amazing? Oh, oh no, 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 no. Now I, I think I've got it. Oh, no, I think it's lovely. Yes, I was watching you dancing before. It's awfully effective when you look at it. <laughs> it's awfully effective when you look at me, too, I bet. I must look like something out of the fall of the House of Usher. <laughs> this sort of thing takes a fearful toll of a woman in my condition. And he worked up his little step himself. He and his degenerate cunning. <laughs> well, I'm past all feeling now. I didn't know what trouble was until I got drawn to this dance macabre. I think... I think my mind's beginning to wander. It almost seems as if the music was stopping. Oh, it couldn't be, of course. No, the governor refused to sign the reprieve. <laughs> what? Stop? Oh, they have stopped the mean thing. They're not going to play anymore. Oh, you darling, you really think they would? You really think so? If you gave them $20? Oh, that would be lovely. And look, do tell them to play the same thing. I simply adore to go on waltzing. <laughs> Well, darling, that approximates my New Year's Eve. And what a New Year's Day, soaking my head and my feet. Luckily, I didn't sit out too many dances. <laughs> well, Lula, I liked your, I liked your one-sided little story, a, a, a monologue, I believe they call it. Yes. And uh, I noticed that you are the only one who gets to do a monologue on this show. <laughs> But I'm afraid that I'm going to have to burst that little uh, bubble tea. It's uh, very entertaining hearing your side of the evening, but have you ever considered what your partner was thinking? I don't believe he could, darling. Well, I think Fred's right, Tallulah. Uh, you know, you uh, women always think you're getting the worst of it in the war between the sexes, but I'd hate to be able to read your partner's mind. Say, just as a lock, Tallulah, would you consider it de rigueur? They want a Hildegard's right as a... Ah! As a strip. <laughs> Then would you be upset if we tried to reconstruct the scene from the fellow's side? I smell a monologue coming up, but go ahead. I'll try not to listen. Don't listen to this, girls. Portland, put your hand over your ears. Now, you too, Fran. Marlena? Yes, Salula. Uh, be an old dear, darling, and don't listen to this. You put your hands over your hearing aid. <laughs> I disconnected it while you were What'd dancing. What'd you say, darling? I disconnected it while you were dancing. Now, go to it, Fran, lady. We fellas are with you. Right, Danny? Yeah, you can count me. Count you in. Okay. <laughs> How about you, Meredith? Fellas against the girls. Okay. I'll do it. Yeah. Goodbye, Rainey, who used to be Mrs. Wilson. <laughs> Say, a little music, Meredith, if you don't mind. Oh, uh, Fred. Yeah, Eddie? See anything you like? Oh... <laughs> I don't know. They're not getting as sharp a crowd as they used to hear at Roseland. <laughs> and the music's louder, too. Notice? Yeah, there are only two left that aren't dancing. Hey, uh, which one do you like? Well, how about the mousy one with the neon sign on her back that lights up and spells Tallulah? <laughs> I'd rather... I'd rather dance with that truck driver. He looks nicer. Oh, shoot, somebody's got him. I'll have to dance with her. Dance? Get a load of that voice. Oh, brother. That's who she sounds like, my brother. What are they playing? It's a waltz, miss. They're playing a waltz, but this kid's doing the Big Apple. She's the type that leads. Uh, what's that? Par my name? It's Jukes. Fred Jukes. My family makes all of those boxes you see around in Paris. The Jukes box. No, 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 I'm not married. No, I've never been married. Yes, I'm single. Yes, I've thought about getting married if the right girl came along. Oh, what a grip on this kid. <laughs> She's clutching me like men are going out of style. <laughs> she's, 
so hard to push around, too. She must have lead in her wedgies or something. Maybe, it, maybe it's her makeup. That makeup she's wearing must weigh as much as she does. I almost feel like I'm dancing with her and Max Factor. Gee, there must be some way I can get rid of this dame. Maybe I ought to kick her in the shins. Say, I think I will kick her in the shins. The way she's dancing, it'll look like an accident. But how can I kick her? She's standing on both of my feet. She must have a sideline selling corn plaster. Hey, look through the window. It's getting light outside. We're the only couple left. Everybody else is gone, but the music is still playing. I thought I saw her slip that band leader 20 bucks. No, I'm sorry, miss. No, no, really, I have to be going. No, it's almost morning. Where am I going? Well, I have to get in line at the unemployment insurance office. <laughs> what? Why do I need unemployment insurance? Because I'm out of radio. Why am I out of radio? I can't hear myself think. If only that music wasn't so loud. So you want to know why I'm out of radio, hey? Well, I'll tell you why I'm out of radio, miss. Stop the music. That's why. <laughs> Fred, that was divinely insane. Well, I hope you're not angry, Tallulah. Oh, no, Fred. I loved every moment of it. It was very charming. And there's just one thing. I wonder what happened to that friend of yours, the dance, the part Eddie played. Oh, uh, that guy, he uh, wound up going out with the boys. With the boys? What fun is that? Oh, he was at that party with Mr. Barry, Mr. Harvey, Mr. Benson, Mr. Harris, Mr. Joyce, Mr. Brown. Marlena, I don't know how you do it. How do you manage to keep so many men interested? I make such good... Bina Schnitzel. <laughs> well, it must be something else, darling, because Betty Crocker comes to me for cupcake lessons. Let's be honest, Lula, darling. No matter what, a better cook than you am I. Ah, oh, come now, Marlena, my precious. Everybody knows that I can do anything better than you can. You must be joking, Tallulah. Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Oh, no, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. You're pressing, darling. <laughs> I can do that better, too. <laughs> Any age you can be, I can be younger. Oh, I can be younger than you'll ever be. Thirty-two. Thirty-one. Twenty-five. Twenty-three. Twenty-one. Nineteen and a half, eighteen and a half, sixteen and a half! Is that your age, darling, or your shoe size? <laughs> I can fill a sweater. I can fill it better. I am known for glamour. I am known for glamour. I can do most anything. Can you pronounce Ed Hurley he high? No. Now they're going to... Any note you can sing, I can sing lower. I can sing any note lower than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Many brave hearts are asleep in the deep. So be well. Be. Step <laughs> 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 Thank you, Marlena, darling, for coming to our show and permitting us to toss you around the way we did. You've been an absolute angel. We hope you'll all be with us next week. 
when our stars will be Louis Calhoun, Jack Carter, Florence Desmond, Jimmy Durante, Martha Ray, Fran Warren and others, and, of course, Meredith Wilson and his big show orchestra and chorus. Until then, may the good Lord bless and keep you, whether near or far away, Fran. May you find that long-awaited golden day today. Edward? May your world will all be small ones, and your fortunes ten times ten. Come on, later. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet. May you walk with sunlight shining and a bluebird in every tree. Meredith? May there be a silver lining back of every cloud you see. Phil? Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows. Never mind what might have been. Fred? May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again, Danny. May you walk with sunlight shining and a bluebird in every tree. May there be a silver lining. Back of every cloud you see Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows Never mind what might have been May the good Lord bless and keep you Until we meet again May the good Lord bless and keep you Good night, darling. Listen to The Big Show next Sunday when we'll have with us Louis Calhern, Jack Carter, Florence Tesman, Jimmy Durante, Martha Ray, and others. Fran Warren, Meredith Wilson, and The Big Show Orchestra and Chorus, and as always, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. The Big Show is directed and produced by D. Engelbach and written by Goodman A., Selma Diamond, George Foster, Mort Green, and Frank Wilson. Listen to Joseph Cotton in Theater Guild on NBC.